Well, friends, uh, welcome to this Bible study, Firm Foundation Bible Study. I'm Pastor Hudson. I'm your, I'm your teacher on today, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you a lesson that I believe will encourage you and help you and help us all. We're talking about prayer, and there is there are there are a few things more important than prayer, and we're going to get into a great lesson on today. We've been teaching at the church on Sunday mornings a series of messages dealing with prayer. Jesus said, or the disciples asked the question, Lord, teach us to pray. And we're looking at Matthew chapter 6, what is sometimes called the Lord's Prayer. It's actually the disciples' prayer. It's the model prayer. It's the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Today I want to take a topic that I believe will be of uh, great importance to us. And that topic is all manner of prayer. We're going to look at this topic and understand that prayer is multifaceted. Prayer has a lot of dimensions to it. Prayer is interesting. You know, it's not just one thing, it's many things. It's all going to God, but the methods that we can pray, uh, use for prayer, are many and diverse. Let's take, first of all, Ephesians chapter 6, and verse 18, which reads, Pray at all times, on every occasion, in every season, in the Spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty. To that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding in behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. That's the Amplified Version of the Bible. We take our title from that particular version that says, it says, pray with all manner of prayer. Some versions say uh, with varieties of prayer. All manner of prayer is the topic today. I want to explore in this topic different types of prayer. And I would not uh, want you to be concerned about, am I praying the right prayer? All prayer is good prayer. <laughs> Every prayer is good. What we're going to do here is help focus your understanding of prayer so that when you pray, you can get more out of it, you can have more faith, you can be more focused, you can think about ways of approaching God in prayer, ways of praying for others, ways of entering into his presence. We're going to cover these different types of prayer, supplication, intercession, agreement, thanksgiving, dedication, and the prayer of faith. This will be in a, uh, an important study for your prayer life. As you'll see, if you haven't already seen, that different types of prayer are more appropriate for different situations. Listen, you can pray any kind of way as long as you're praying to God. Again, like I said before, don't get uptight about am I praying the right prayer. All prayer is good. But as you grow in God, as you mature in the Lord, as you become more focused in your prayer life, you can, you can focus prayer in, in very specific ways according to the Bible. And these uh, six items here, this, these six varieties or manners of prayer, you'll find them to be a great use in your life. Let's dive in. First of all, there's two ways to pray. According to 1 Corinthians um, chapter 14, we can pray with the understanding and we can pray in the spirit. Let me get that scripture now. Let's see if I have that in my list already uh, programmed in here. Yes, let's take this now. I'm going to skip ahead a couple slides and take 1 Corinthians 14, 14. The Apostle Paul wrote, If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I pray with the understanding. Well, when he says pray in a tongue, he's talking about praying in tongues, praying in your heavenly language. Now, we, we believe that praying in tongues is scriptural and valid, hasn't passed away, because it, there are tongues of men and tongues of angels, Paul said. And praying in tongues or unknown language is an expression of our spirit. He says, when I pray in the tongue, my spirit prays. Think about that. When the Spirit of God is praying, through you, and we come back to this in the intercession lesson, but when, when the Spirit of God is helping us to pray, 
he, he doesn't always speak English. <laughs> he speaks his own language. It may sound like gibberish to some, may sound like moaning and groaning. That's not the point. The point is you're praying from the, a place uh, that the Holy Spirit resides, and you're praying from a place where uh, your mind can't comprehend because when he says, I pray with, with, uh, with my understanding, that's praying according to what I know. There are things you know to pray about. There are people whose names you know to pray about, but there are people you don't know. There are circumstances you don't know about, but the Spirit knows everything. He knows all people, all circumstances. So praying in tongues, praying in the tongues, and my spirit prays. We'll come back to that. That's a very key reality uh, for us in our prayer lives. So we pray with understanding, and that's in English. We pray according to whatever knowledge we have. We must pray this way for supplications and agreement. So if I ask you to pray for my family or pray for a situation I tell you about, I just told you about it. You know it. You can pray according to what you know. So understanding is plainly praying according to whatever knowledge we have. Secondly, we, we pray in the Spirit. And so our Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us, is praying through us, our spirit prays, we might not know mentally what is being said, less by interpretation. Praying in the Spirit permits the Holy Spirit to use our prayers far beyond the scope of our understanding. For example, we can pray for people we do not know personally, but that God knows, right? So I could ask you to pray for Daniel Maruri in Kenya. I could ask you to pray for Georgia Kwanzi in Nigeria. I can call any number of names of people I know that you don't know. Well, God knows them, and there are people I don't know who uh, I should pray for, don't know their name or their circumstances. I'm just aware that I should pray for them. And I cannot say a whole lot from my knowledge. I say, Lord, bless them, help them. You can't say much more than that. But the Spirit of God in you and your spirit can pray. And that's, that's an important dimension of, of pray, prayer, two, two ways to pray, with the understanding and with or in the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 is a foundation scripture. Again, we'll look at this for intercession as well, but it says, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. What weakness? Well, he tells us, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, groanings, that can't be uttered, that could be tongues. That could be tongues, groanings. It's not about what it sounds like. It's about the reality that that prayer is coming from a different part of you. We are spirit, we're soul, and we're body. We do a whole lot of stuff out of our, out of our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions. We act, obviously, a lot with the body, physically. But there's a third dimension. As a matter of fact, you are a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body. That's the real definition of a person. You are a spirit. You're made in God's image. He's spirit. You are a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body. All right. So he says here, for he searches the hearts. For he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He makes intercession for you, for me, according to God's will. Now, what's, listen, we'll come back to this again, but what's, what's better than this, that to have the Holy Spirit present with us and working through us, who can intercede for us according to God's will? Listen, we in our mind, in our understanding, we cannot always pray according to God's will. We don't know what God's will is. We don't know enough to know. But if I pray with and through the Spirit, then I'm in touch with the Spirit of God who's in touch with everything and every purpose. We'll come back to that. Let's start with supplication, the prayer of supplication. Requestions or definite requests or a specific request. Supplication is a specific request. These scriptures, misspelling, show requests for something specific. When you know what is needed, you can offer a prayer supplication. 
So prayer supplication is you praying with the understanding. That can go off into an intercession, but you start with knowing what it is you're asking for, which is pretty obvious. Example of this is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, where Paul gave us instruction. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that uh, all supplications and prayer intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men. He goes and talks about prayer for, you know, kings and those in authority and so forth. Well, he's, he's saying to us that supplications. Well, we know, we, we know a lot about, uh, we hear a lot about what people are dealing with. You Sometimes people ask you to pray for them. Uh, we are aware of things through information, through phone calls and text messages. There's a lot for us to offer supplication about. Now, I also say this, that you can also ask God a question. You can, you can ask God questions, things you want to know, things you're not clear about, right? Supplication is, is that direct communication, like talking to somebody you know. And we know God, right? So talk to somebody you know. Matthew 26, 34, uh, 26, 39, excuse me, it says this, he went a little further, speaking of Jesus, and he fell on his face and prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus in the garden, going through his passion, and, and even though he was God, the son, he was going through this suffering as the son of man. And he was tempted, as we are. He was tempted to not go through with what he was there to do. That's why he said, Oh, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. The cup of suffering, the cup of torment, all the torture that was coming, he, he knew was coming. And yet, in that same breath, he said, Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. And that's an example of supplication. Sometimes you struggle as you talk to God, you express your concerns and you know, misgivings and may ask to be excused from something. And it's, it's a real conversation with God. So supplication is specific requests, specific requests. Let's talk about intercession. Come back to that topic of intercession, praying for others. To intercede means to plead or meditate on behalf of another person. Jesus intercedes for us. Hebrews 7.25 tells us that. You can look that up. Holy Spirit prays for us and through us as we pray in the Spirit and with our understanding. So we're back to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding. And he goes on and talks about singing in the Spirit and with understanding. Uh, verse 16, otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of uh, the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not, not understand what you say? So obviously, if a person in the same room doesn't know what you're saying, you're speaking in tongues. Not just a language, French or Spanish, because even French and Spanish and all the rest of the languages, Greek and Hebrew back then, were languages of men. So the spirit language is, is something different. And it's a wonderful blessing to be able to, to, to pray to God in the spirit or in tongues, as we often say. As controversial as it seems to some, it is, it, is, it is biblical and it hasn't passed away. And you should seek that grace from God. Intercession is so key, praying for others. We plead for others, all right? We plead for others on behalf, of, we, plead or medit or we plead or mediate, excuse me, on behalf of other, another person. That is, if we're aware of a situation, it's like, it's like this, okay, here's God over here and the person over there, and you put yourself between God and that person. In, in the sense of, you're gonna present this person to God, Lord, I'm adding my faith to theirs, I'm praying for them, and you're, and you're praying for them that they would pay attention to God, that God would bless them. It's interceding, getting right in the middle with the help of the Holy Spirit and lifting up people. Intercession is so key, it's so vital. All of us need others interceding for us. We just cannot bear this load or burdens or whatever it is by ourselves or calling, even good stuff. Can't bear it by yourself. So God has sent people to intercede for you. We pray for one another in this manner. And we pray in the spirit about things we don't know about. And we pray with our understanding. So when, when someone, again, asks you to pray for them, you say, what shall I pray for? 
and they give you a specific request, and you pray according to that. Now, you can also, again, because people, <laughs> we all ask for stuff. We ask for things and don't know what we're asking sometimes, honestly. We just think we know what we want. We don't know what we need, and God has to help us. So even in there, praying in the Spirit, right, will help translate what they're trying to communicate into, into something God can really use. Now, what may happen is when you pray in the Spirit, you won't even know. You won't know, maybe, what you're praying for. It doesn't matter. As long as you're praying for them and that intercession goes forth to connect them to God's purpose, connect them to God and God to them, that's, if, hey, that's where, wherever God's Spirit is, there's liberty. So whatever they need, <laughs> if the Spirit of God show up, it's going to be liberty for them. Amen? So again, think about that text, Romans 8.26, very powerful text as it relates to intercession. And then going on here, let's take another thought here. Uh, Luke 22.32, Jesus said, I have prayed for you, talking about Peter, I pray for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. So Jesus foresaw Peter's failure. We know he departed uh, from him in, in the garden. But, but Jesus saw it, and he prayed for him that his faith would not fail. Well, his faith did fail, but he said, but I pray that, that, you, will sh that you will return to me. When you return to me, when you come back, you will strengthen your brother, brethren. And Peter did exactly that, right? He, he, he was tempted, he failed, he stumbled, but he came on back. And prayer paved the road for Peter to come back. See, prayer does a lot of things. And the biggest thing prayer does are things we don't know. Please hear that. You have to pray and trust God. We cannot project into prayer what we want unless we know what God wants. And people have told us, but most of the time we pray in the Spirit, you can only present the whole thing to God and trust God for the results. But have faith. You know, trust Him to do what He promised to do in scripture. However, everyone must learn to obey God for themselves as well. So at some point, people may have to suffer, people may have to go through some different things until they submit their will to the will of God. Acts 12 and 5, Peter therefore was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. So the church was aware that Peter was in prison and prayer was offered and prayers were heard and prayers were answered. Again, intercession, praying for others. All right, the prayer of agreement for manifesting God's purpose. The prayer of agreement occurs when two, um, two or a few people come together, the fewer the better, in agreement with one another and with the word of God on something God wants to do. The prayer of agreement is connected to, uh, to the authority of God that God has vested in his church. Prayers of agreement can multiply the effects of God's blessing beyond what one can do by oneself. Amen. Matthew 18, verse 19, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that you ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Well, the prayer of agreement manifests purpose. That's why we don't waste that prayer on frivolous things. When we come together to agree in prayer, I always teach this. If someone says with, to you, let's agree in prayer. Well, you, you have to ask, well, tell me about what we're praying about. What are you talking about here? What do you want? And you have to listen to what they're saying and decide if you can agree with that. It's the prayer of agreement. It's not just, you know, it's not just your favorite prayer and I just go along with it. You're asking me to agree with you and to add my faith to yours and to bear witness to the fact this is what God is doing. And, and the prayer of agreement needs to be in, into slow. That's why he said with two or three, not with 10 or 15. You can never get that many, a whole bunch of people to agree on something. It's hard to get two people to agree. But when you get agreement on a purpose and you sense it's what God wants and you pray on that, the Bible says God said, I'm going to do for them. I'm going to do, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. Now, he did not say exactly what he would do, but we, we know with other Bible scriptures and by the Spirit, we're not talking about frivolous things. I want the house, 
I want that house on the hill. No, let's go buy the house. If you got some money, go buy the house on the hill, you know. We don't, we don't use a prayer agreement always for just things that we want, unless those things are for the purpose of God. That's, that's my perspective on that. But yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that whatever Jesus authorizes, it fits in God's plan. Acts 14, Acts 1 and 14 says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And this was the upper room. They continued, and it goes on to say, and the Spirit of God fell upon them. God showed up in a powerful way. And that was a function of their agreement. Now, it was more than two or three up there, but they found agreement. They were in one accord in one place. They were supplicating according to Jesus' instruction. He said to them, go up and wait for the promise of the Father. And they did that. It was a lot of people, a rare occasion where a lot of folk could agree, but they were full of God's purpose, full of God's per, uh, presence, and God manifested himself. Acts 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Right? So there was, in chapter 1, there was them following the mandate, and in chapter 2, that the Spirit of God showed up in a powerful way. They were all with one accord in one place, and the Spirit of God filled the place. The Bible says they had cloven tongues like as a fire. It wasn't fire, but it looked like fire. The glory of God manifesting on them in a, in a, great, in a great presence, a Shekinah glory, if you will. So agreement will manifest God's purpose. Please keep that in mind. Thanksgiving, the prayer of thanksgiving. Celebrating God's presence in our circumstances. Praise, worship, and thanksgiving can be a form of prayer that brings us into the presence of God. When we praise and thank God, we are affirming our faith in Him. This pleases God and helps our faith. Praise and thanksgiving disarm two of the most deadly enemies to our Christian faith, uh, our Christian walk, rather, by affirming God in our presence. And those enemies would be doubt and unbelief. And when we, when we praise God and worship him, it's amazing how it transforms us spiritually and even mentally and emotionally. You know how it is sometimes you start praying, you have no particular feeling, you may even feel bad that day or not feel like praying. But because you're doing it by faith and because the spirit of God is not in your emotions, He's in your spirit. When your spirit prays and your, and your mind is involved, you get your whole being involved. It's like what David said. David said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all this within me, bless his holy name. You get to a point where even your soul, your physical being, your, your emotional self wants to bless God. That happens when you immerse yourself in God's presence. And thanksgiving is the way that that comes forth. It's amazing how just giving God thanks, not thanking him, in terms of just, I thank you for my house, for my wife, for my job. I mean, that's a part of it. But it's more of thanksgiving in the presence because the Lord, thank you for your goodness, your grace. You know what it is, just thanking him for everything he is to you. Not just thanking him for the things you have, which is appropriate, but thanking God for him and for your opportunity uh, to be in his presence. And that when you begin to, to thank God that way, it just sheds the light. It sheds the darkness, rather. It brings the light, and it causes doubt to fade and unbelief to fade. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. See that? Giving thanks always for all things. Being thankful all the time. Even when things look bad, you're still thankful to God. Whether things go great, things go poorly, we give God thanks because think about this. If things go poorly and you don't thank God, then the bad thing will drag your mood down. The bad situation will drag your, your feelings down, right? So when you begin to give God thanks in the middle of your bad situation, you elevate your spirit and really can pull your soul back into, back into joy. Because again, we're, we are a spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. So what comes out of your spirit is going to take precedence over what's in your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, right? Those feelings will submit to 
your spirit if you give God thanks. Acts 16, 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, everyone's chains were loosed. Now, this is an amazing story, a miracle, a miracle manifested through the thanksgiving and the prayers and the, and the worship and the singing of Paul and Silas. It released the power of God in an earthquake manifestation, right? But it also unlocked doors. I mean, you can shake things and doors not be unlocked. So obviously it was more than just a natural earthquake. It was a supernatural occurrence that felt like an earthquake, and it opened the prison gates and prison doors. And the story goes on, you know that when the doors opened up, the prison guards thought, well, there goes our job, there goes our lives. Let's just kill ourselves now because they're going to kill us when they find out the prisoners escape. But, but again, that's where Paul and Silas called out to them, don't, don't hurt yourself. You know, it's a, a whole supernatural thing happened all night long. People got saved, and it was a marvelous, a marvelous instance of what Thanksgiving can do. Now, I cannot guarantee you that you have an earthquake and, and shake things loose, but I can say this. If you praise God, your situation will improve because you will improve. You know that, listen, when you change, your circumstances change. Let, let it soak in there. No, Pastor, I'm waiting for the thing to change. No, you got to change first. When you change, the circumstances change. Because think about it. If circumstances are occurring, you know, because of what you're involved with and what you're doing or how you look at it, then you have to change for it to change. And ultimately, we have authority in the earth. Ultimately, ultimately, what we believe and say and do is going to dictate what happens around us. But there's exceptions to that, of course. But, it, but basically, in principle, when you change, your circumstances change. So Thanksgiving is the beginning of that. Let's talk about more about Thanksgiving, driving out darkness. Here's a scripture from Romans. I read this often. Those who are members of our church have heard this many times, but it still bears repeating. Romans 121, the Apostle Paul wrote, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Neither were thankful. Neither were thankful, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Now he's speaking of people who they knew God, according to the text, but did not glorify him as God. Now that's a really big problem, people. It's a huge problem to say you know God and don't glorify him as God and are not thankful. Then he said, and they uh, and became futile or empty in their thoughts, right? So if we don't, if we who know God don't glorify and thank God and use our minds and direct our thoughts toward him, your thoughts don't remain static. Your thoughts and your life don't just stand still while we forget about God, right? If we don't serve God and thank God, you don't. You get swept up with the current. Like you, um, if you go stand in a in a in a river that has a, a current to it, you try to just you know float in that river. It's going to carry you in the direction it's flowing. Now, if you can swim, you can actually swim against the current if it's not too strong. So your action keeps you from being swept in the current. Same thing in life. If if we're swimming and praying and worshiping and giving God thanks, it literally keeps us f moving against the tide, against the current, if you will. If you think you're standing still, you're actually going backwards. Think about it. A person who's floating in the water can have his arms, his hands still. He can fold his arms up, but he's actually being carried away. Complacency carries you away. Futility carries you away. And that's an important lesson. Therefore, if you know God, glorify him as God and be thankful. And it says, professing to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. That's getting deep now. People who, you know, who don't serve God, who have gone away from God. I mean, it's to me the con it seemed to me talking about believers, people who say they knew God, 
In other words, consequences of saying I know God, but not glorify him as God. I mean, the context, I think, is the same. It's, it's, it's pretty hard reading. But listen, don't put it, don't, don't, we cannot underestimate the danger of not glorifying God, of not giving God thanks. He goes on and says, therefore God gave them up to uncleanness. Well, see, why would God have to give you up? Because you were there, you know, you were with him, but you chose not to follow him. You chose not to glorify him. So God gives you up in the sense that he allows you to suffer the consequence of your decision. Now, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> That's just too much bad news. You get the point. Glorify God, all right? Glorify God and be thankful to him. All right, let's talk about the prayer dedication. The prayer dedication is for consecration to purpose. Dedication, we think it's more symbolic, but it really has high purpose and great significance. The prayer dedication is used to consecrate or dedicate someone or something to God. In the Old Testament, priests, altars, tabernacles were dedicated by prayer. In the New Testament, Jesus and others directed or dedicated or ordained disciples, apostles, elders, deacons to the work of God. Dedication. Dedication. We think about baby dedication, which is, has become kind of ceremonial. But I remember I saw a black and white picture of, of me being held up at Friendship Missionary Baptist Church back in, you know, 1957, 58, whatever it was, holding me up, praying for me, dedicating me to God. And I, here I am today, dedicated to God, right? I'm, ded I'm serving God. All, I, I, just, I serve him with, with my whole heart, as much as I, I'm able to. And, and that began with my parents, my, my father, my mother, and, you know, my family there, and the pastor, I think Arthur Johnson back then, dedicated me to Jesus Christ. So, the, so when you do things in the spirit of God, it, it, it sets a foundation under you, right? And I tell you, I, I dedicate a lot of things to God. I don't talk about it, you don't have to, but I dedicate my car and my equipment. Now I don't do this publicly. I don't, I don't say you don't <laughs> have a service and drag your stuff up in the church for dedication. You know, it'll take all that. But the point is, when you dedicate, you're, you're literally saying, God, I depend on you now. I'm not gonna depend on myself. I'm going to do what I, I'll be responsible, but I'm depending on you, Lord, for this purpose. And we lay hands and pray for, of course, we pray for preachers, ordained preachers and ministers and deacons and all the rest. And, and so we do that to set them in an office. Think about it. Even a marriage is a dedication. When, we, when I pray for people and, and lead them in taking the vows, they become married. It's not magic. But it's something God is doing. It's recognized, you know, by, by God and by the government. And I'm literally, you know, holy matrimony, we call it, because, you know, holy matrimony is men and women. Now, everything else is not really marriage. But holy matrimony is what is, is man and woman. Let's be clear about that. I'm, even though I know that's, that's, the world don't believe that, but, <laughs> but the Bible teaches it. That is the power of dedication. It, it makes two people one. It's a great mystery. Paul said, but it speaks of Christ and the church. Well, dedication. Mark 14, 36, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. We read this earlier. Take this cup away from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. Well, we use that as a prayer of supplication, but it's also a prayer of dedication, right? You can see dedication also there. I'm dedicating myself, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Acts 7, 59, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord, Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he said this, he fell asleep. So as they were murdering Stephen, if you will, he was dedicating his spirit to God. Even while his body was being buffeted to death, he was dedicating his spirit to God. Acts 9, verse 6 so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? This was Saul being confronted on the Damascus Road by Jesus. And I give Saul credit. He had enough sense to say, Lord, <laughs> what do you want me to do? He recognized this is, this is not my imagination. 
this is God. And the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city. You will be told what you must do. Amen. So that was dedication prayer. Lord, what do you want me to do? That's a very good dedication prayer, right? Not about what I want, but Lord, what do you want me to do? That's an excellent dedication, a brief statement and prayer dedication. All right, the prayer of faith for bold and supernatural works of God. I'll say to do, I'll say to do bold and supernatural works from God. Prayer of faith is amazing. We, we all have faith in God and we have what we call regular faith and we just believe God for a good day and safety on the job, which is always important. It's, it's faith, but you could call this special faith. It's, it's a faith that is is inspired of God. It's, the, it's a gift of faith, really, from 1 Corinthians. It talks about different gifts of the Spirit, and uh, faith is one of those mentioned. So you could call it the, the special faith or the gift of faith. James 5.14 says, If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up and if he's committed sins, they'll be forgiven. Well, when someone calls for elders to come and pray for them, think about it. It's a big deal. You call, however you're going to call them. Back then, they sent a messenger or something. Today, we can make a phone call. Well, when you ask people to go out of their way to come to you to pray for you, you must be pretty serious about it, right? In other words, it's, it's just not a casual thing. And there's nothing casual about the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith is, is, is well-considered. It's, it's, you know, you have this sense of, of what God wants to do. I won't say it's all-consuming, but, but you have the sense of nothing. I mean, you have the sense, Lord, I want you, I need you, I'm ready for you. There's just not that doubt. It's not that second-guessing. And then when we come and pray for you, we pray a specific prayer. It's the prayer of faith. We're not saying, Lord, if it, if it be thy will, there's no faith in that. We believe it is God's will. So, so the prayer of faith is in line with the will of God, which he wants to heal people. He wants to save people, deliver people. That's always God's will. So the prayer of faith, he said, and every prayer should be a prayer of faith. Now, I understand that, but, there's a, but the prayer of faith, in my mind, as you can see here in the text, indicated by calling for the elders to come, it, it's an event. It's something very special. It indicates uh, a special faith in the heart of those who request and those who are going to pray. Matthew 17, 18, and Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Lord, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move here, from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. This kind doesn't go out. This kind of what? This kind of faith or this kind of demon or this kind of whatever. Whatever it needs to be doesn't go out by prayer, but by prayer and fasting. Now, what's the context here? Well, the context is the disciples were asked to, to pray for a child uh, who was oppressed and, and uh, couldn't do it. They, they, they actually tried. They tried and, and didn't succeed. So they brought, them, brought him to Jesus. He rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. The child was cured. So the question was, Lord, why can't we do that? We, just, we tried too, but the answer is curious. He said, because of your unbelief. Now, unbelief, this is a very important lesson. Unbelief is not, not believing. See, they believed in it because they tried. They believed in the power of deliverance, and they prayed, and they said what they said, and nothing happened. So how could unbelief be not believing? No, listen, unbelieving is not not believing. Unbelieving is having insufficient faith, insufficient faith, insufficient preparation. Now, I always say the same illustration. I'm going to say it again. It's like this. If a, a young man is a high jumper, in, say, high school, he goes and jumps six feet, five inches, and he, he, he jumps, he jumps, he jumps it, you know, successfully, go up, you know, 
six feet, I say six, no, six feet five inches, six feet six inches, he jumps six six, and he can jump that. It's challenging, but he can jump it. Let's say he just breaks off training, doesn't train for a month, comes back out there and tries to jump six five and knocks the bar over. Tries again, puts it back up, runs up to it, knocks it off again. In his mind, thinking, I've jumped this before. I have jumped this height. I've jumped six six before. But he can't jump it that way because he's not prepared. And that's the sense I believe we can take this scripture, that unbelief is a lack of preparedness. And if we're not people of prayer and people of fasting, or fasting and prayer, the, the point there is, what fasting and prayer does, first of all, fasting and prayer does not move God. Nothing moves God. He's already moving. <laughs> all right? So we the ones have to move our doubt, our distractions, right, our lack of dedication, our lack of preparation, that's the stuff that has to move. And so when we can move out those barriers and hurdles and things in us, then we'll be able to have faith. Again, unbelief is not not believing. Unbelief is a lack of preparation, lack of faith, lack of preparedness. So fasting and prayer, when you don't eat and don't get distracted by things, then you, it helps your, your spiritual life to ascend. You become more spiritually minded because you're not thinking about grabbing this and grabbing that. And so fasting has that, that function of helping you isolate on God, on the things of God. That's, that's the function of fasting and prayer, not to make yourself hungry, right? But it's to make yourself, it's to clear yourself from distractions, even food. And, and or fast TV, fast sports, you can fast a lot of things. As long as you let your spirit rise to God, and that unbelief won't be your problem. Amen? All right, well, I trust you enjoyed uh, the lesson on today. I've enjoyed sharing it, and I believe that uh, we've, all been, we've all been helped in this, uh, in this lesson. I know I have. I, I'm teaching it and it helped me. And I want you to, to think about these things and, and go back over the notes and watch this message again on on our uh, YouTube channel, our podcast, because prayer in this hour, in this day, it always has been, but prayer today is a great priority, maybe more than ever. And uh, so I want you to lock in to God and seek Him and press into Him. Let this lesson be a, just a blessing to you and help you elevate your prayer life, all right? Lord, thank you for your presence on today. Thank you for the those who are viewing today, who are on this uh, Bible study. I pray you would encourage each one. You would stretch us all so our faith can stretch and we can Lord, understand that prayer and fasting, Lord, helps us to remove distraction and we may seek you and have that, that connection, that stronger sense of connection with you, even though we're connected. But Lord, that elevate that sense of connection. Lord, thank you for all the points today and, and helping us to just lean into you and exercise our faith in supplication and intercession and agreement and thanksgiving and dedication and prayer of faith. Lord, all these prayers are all going to you, but help us to learn how to focus our prayer, Lord, in these ways. And I thank you for touching hearts, saving people, encouraging your people. In Jesus' name, amen.